La persona que va a subir The person who's going to come to the stage now is considered as one of the greatest leaders of industrial thought. Stuart Dorman, he is chief of innovation officer of Grupo Sabio. They help their customers to use technology to have a better customer experience thanks to innovation and disruptive thought. He's the, one of the members of the jury of the major awards of the sector in Asia and here in Europe. He, he today is going to talk about the Jamie, Jamie's case. Jamie is the virtual assistant that thanks to Savio, the Singapore government is using. A round of applause for Stuart Dorman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm actually one of only two English speaking presenters here today, so I hope that you'll bear with me. Um, my name's Stuart Dorman. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at the Savio Group. Um, and I've been working in the customer experience sector now for over 20 years. And during that period, Sabio has been building self-service solutions that rely really heavily on behavioral economics as part of the design process. And the reason that we do that is in order to design solutions that are really geared around understanding the customer's emotions and their motives and what they're looking to achieve in order to make it as simple as possible for them to achieve their task. And that's across voice solutions as well as chatbots and virtual assistants. Um, The principles that I'm going to talk about today apply to anything, but I'm going to talk specifically about the Singapore government for a couple of reasons. Firstly, as far as we are aware, this is one of the, uh, the largest deployments of this kind of technology anywhere in the world. The Singapore government, as, as you probably know, is one of the most advanced digital governments, and, and partly that's due to the initiative that I'm going to talk about today. <coughs> and the second reason is that Governments are quite an interesting domain. Even in somewhere like Singapore, which is an island state with five million people, there are over a hundred different departments that are you know, managing education, healthcare, all these different services, and therefore it's a very, very complex domain. It's very difficult for people to understand, and therefore if we can humanize that experience using artificial intelligence, it makes it much easier for people to, uh, to understand what they're looking to achieve. So before we do that, I'd like to take a bit of a step back. And if we think back now, you know, for thousands of years, um, behavioral economics really has been down to us as individuals and our ability to be able to interpret the emotions of the person that we're speaking to. The best salespeople, you know, the, the best people delivering service, were able to pick up on those emotional cues and adjust and adapt to the way that they communicate by, by you know, using the advantage that they have by th those face-to-face -face communications. And that's been taking place for many, many thousands of years, pretty much right up to the middle of the last century, when along came the telephone. Now, one, some of the challenges of, of that face-to-face -face communication were geographic. We were limited to, you know, to, to, the, to the surrounding areas and the face-to-face the -face dialogue that we had. The telephone removed that. It meant that we could speak to anybody anywhere in the world, which was, which was fantastic. However, it came with uh, some, some limitations. Immediately, we, we lost the ability to pick up on those non-verbal cues that you and I have when we talk to each other face to face. The telephone put a barrier in the way, and it became much more difficult. Yes, we could tell if someone was angry and they were shouting down the phone to us, but it became more difficult to pick up on the non-verbal cues. And then as we moved into the 90s and the, the noughties, along came the web, more and more of our interactions with customers took place through this technology. The humans started to get removed out of the loop. And whilst we could design great experiences graphically, it was really difficult then to understand emotions and intent and the, the, uh, the reasons that people were contacting. And then you move further still towards the smartphone. And now we're all using these amazing you know, devices. It's fantastic for convenience and self-service. But again, we're working with a much smaller screen, a much smaller bit of real estate. So it becomes even harder to push information through that and to understand what the customers are looking to achieve and what their emotional states are. So we've been living through this user interface era now where technology sits between us and the customer for maybe 30 or 30 plus years. Um, we've got the telephony UIs, we've got graphical user interfaces, we've got touch user interfaces, and all of them put a barrier up between us and the customer. But we're now starting to see a bit of a move back to rehumanizing that experience through artificial intelligence. 
And specifically, when I talk about AI here, it's a very big domain, as you can imagine. But here I'm talking specifically about conversational user interfaces, the ability to understand natural language and start to communicate with customers in that way and, and, and be able to interpret that and give the right answer back to the customer. So we're now moving into this era where conversational UIs are really starting to rehumanize that experience. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today in the context of the Singapore government. So the Ask Jamie initiative um, was launched back in 2014. And what the Singapore government were looking to do is to look for a way of rehumanizing all of these complex services that were available to their citizens through the various different 100 plus websites that, that people could access. They were looking to put in place what they call a whole of government virtual assistant. And what that means is that this virtual assistant could sit on any one of the different websites that the customer, that the citizens could access. And they had this idea that they called No Wrong Door. And the idea behind that was that regardless of which website you went to, you could ask a question, and if it wasn't relating to that website, you could dive, be diverted to the correct website, it could tap into the knowledge base, and you could get your question answered. So it started to really remove that confusion from customers. And ultimately, their objective was to provide better self-service, humanizing self-service, and, and reducing the number of phone calls that were being handled by their many, many different contact centers. So as I mentioned, we, we first started working with them back in 2014. And initially, the pilot went across four different sites. And I think the, the reason that um, we were successful is that we treated this very much not, not as a technology product uh, project, but as a people project. They've been working with some other vendors, people like IBM, with their, their Watson product, which is an incredibly sophisticated piece of AI technology. But we looked at it very much from a human perspective. We spent time out there interviewing citizens, understanding their motives, understanding what they were looking to do. And, and we really started to build the system around that, as well as engaging with the people that were handling the calls in their contact centers. Um, that was really successful. And in 2015, we were awarded that contract. And we've been escalating and, and growing this ever since. Um, by 2016, we were across 23 different sites. And we'd integrated into their live chat platform. And that integration between AI and humans and live chat is really, really crucial to understand why people are falling out, to get the data, and to improve the, the conversations. That grew to 48 sites uh, by 2017. And that's when we started introducing voice into the mix as well. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, in 2018, we're up at, up at 78 different sites. And we started to integrate with the SingPass, which is something that every single citizen of Singapore has. They have a unique reference and pass that they can use. And what that allows us to do is to start to personalize the services specifically to each and every citizen as they, as they come and engage. Now, there's two different ways that you, we can think about AI being used in, in the context of these digital experiences. The first is using it to understand natural language and to engage with, engage with citizens or engage with customers in a way that's natural to them. And that's really challenging through a more conventional graphical user interface, where pretty much we have a one-size-fits-all, regardless of who you are and your understanding of the task or the domain that you're, you're looking to engage with. So what a conversational user interface allows us to do is to get that input from a customer, engage very quickly whether that customer has a deep understanding of the subject, whether they're confused. We can take them on a conversational journey. If they make an error, we can, we can correct that error. We can offer them different services. We can nudge them in the right direction in order for them to achieve the right outcome that they're looking to do. And that's one of the real advantages of, of this kind of technology. And then from an output perspective as well, there is a, a, a lot of thinking that's going on at the moment around using machine learning to generate content and to feed information back to users, to citizens. But the technology isn't mature enough yet. It's great to make suggestions about what people might be saying, but we still very much believe that it's about curating content. It's about making sure that we can humanize that experience through great design once we understand what the customer is looking to do and their level of understanding. Um, so, so now we're at over 80 internet and intranet sites. In, in some cases, we're delivering up to 30% of calls that are being deflected away from their call centers. We've got over 42,000 different bits of knowledge and information and answers that we can tailor specifically to the level of understanding of each of the citizens that come in. So for example, if somebody has a good understanding, we can give them more information. We can talk more technically about some of the language. If somebody doesn't really have a great understanding, we can take them on a step-by-step -step journey to educate them. 
Um, we have over 10 million questions answered a year now through the platform, and we continue to make enhancements and customiza uh, customizations. And as I mentioned earlier, in 2017, we started putting the same database that was sitting on the website on the voice channel. And this, this started to get really interesting because we could start to engage with customers on the telephone now uh, as well. And, and already, you know, in some cases, we're deflecting up to 50% of the calls away from the contact center simply by providing knowledge over the voice channel. I've got a video here that I'm going to play for you. percent fewer calls, all thanks to a chatbot which uh, solves queries. Now this enhanced efficiency could be a glimpse into the future, as the government's technology arm, GovTech, says it is looking to roll out voice chatbots to other agencies. Cheryl Lin finds out just how prevalent this technology is in Singapore. Hi Siri, could you set a reminder for a meeting at 5 p.m. tomorrow? Okay, I added meeting to your reminders for tomorrow at 1700 hours. This is an example of voice-activated technology that most of us have in our back pockets. Other examples include in-app features or even smart home assistant devices that can control your lights. Ask Jamie Voice is another voice-activated chatbot. It's currently used on the baby bonus and secondary school posting hotlines. The Education Ministry says its human operators have had to handle 30% fewer calls since this virtual assistant came on board last November. We are able to achieve higher call deflection rate and improve the productivity across the government. And if the bot is able to provide the direct answers that the user is looking for, the call centre agent can actually make use of the time to handle more personalised queries. So as you can see there, you know, this, this was um, the, one of the, the Asian news uh, channels that were talking about the, the platform. And wherever you go in Singapore, people know about Ask Jamie. You know, they talk about it. And as you can see, it's being picked up by the news networks. It's a very familiar concept, very comforting concept to citizens to know that they can engage with this, this AI to be able to solve their problems. Um, but uh, and the, the other interesting point that was picked up on there is is the the feedback that we get from the people in the call centres as well because they're no longer having to deal with these mundane you know repetitive tasks. It's made their job much more interesting as they deal with these really engaging you know more complex inquiries. But the interesting thing about this is the way that we're, we're able to switch modalities as well, depending on uh, what the task is that the customer is looking to achieve. And I'm going to illustrate this by giving you a couple of examples of, of the different kind of voice assistants that we have today. So does anybody here have, use Alexa at all? Raise of hands. A few people, yeah. What about Siri? Does anybody use Siri? Yeah, a few more hands. So a few more people using Siri. So I'm going to give you a quick example here. If I say to Alexa, Alexa, what's the weather like in London today? In London, it's 19 degrees Celsius with mostly cloudy skies. Today, you can expect intermittent clouds with a high of 20 degrees and a low of 10 degrees. Okay, so firstly, it's, it's obviously amazing that we can speak to technology these days and get that information back. But as you probably noticed, it took around about 20 seconds for Alexa to feed that information back to me. So. Voice is a great input channel, really easy for me to issue commands, but it can take some time to play information back. It's a serial way of presenting information. So let's think about if we do the same thing for, for Siri. So if I say, hey Siri, what's the weather like today in London? Okay, here's the weather for today. So you can see very quickly by adding a screen into the mix and presenting information alongside voice in a multimodal way, within a few split seconds, I was able to absorb a huge amount of information. It was really interesting listening to the lady this morning talking about the, the bandwidth that we have to consume information in our, you know, as, as humans. And, and I think this is a really interesting concept that works both for AI, but also for the people that work in our call centers as well. You know, voice is a very serial channel. It's very challenging to get information across quickly in that domain. And it really helps if we can combine that with a screen. And that's what we're doing at the Singapore government. So we're allowing people to call into the call centers and we can have an engaging conversation with them over the telephone, but we can combine that by pushing information to them, either through SMS or Facebook Messenger, that maybe gives them a bit more detail or gives them a visual interaction that they can have, that they can take that information away and, and, and work with. So it's this combination of this multimodal approach that's able to get people to the right answer, to nudge them in the right direction and give them the outcome that they're looking for. So just to conclude, we, you know, we all think differently 
Um, each and every one of us, depending on the situation that we're in, maybe we're out on the street and we're walking down the road, maybe the device that we're on, maybe the motivation that we have, or perhaps it's our understanding of the domain that we're looking to work in. Uh, in the case of the Singapore government, as I say, you have people that really understand taxation or education and other people that really don't understand it at all and are incredibly confused by these multitude of different services um, that, that governments offer. And what AI and conversational UI allows us to do is to rehumanize that experience. It allows people to express their intent uh, in a much more natural way, and it allows us to understand the level of understanding that that person has and tailor the response accordingly and give a much more natural conversational type of experience. So are we... Where are we in terms of this AI revolution? Lots of people have been very excited about this over the last few years. Um, and I, I think we're still very early on. I think you know, AI is, is really fantastic at pattern matching. That's where we are today, machine learning in particular. It's great at matching patterns. And that means it's good at understanding natural language, both in terms of the way people speak and the way people input data uh, using text messaging and, and those kinds of applications. But we're certainly a long way away from being able to have artificial intelligence push responses back to users. We still need humans involved to take the input, to understand what the customer is looking to achieve, and to tailor content and to push content back to them accordingly. We do, however, at Savio, believe that um, over the next few years, the vast majority of interactions that flow in and out of, of, con of contact centers in particular, but anywhere there's a human involved, we think that ain't that interaction will flow through some kind of a conversational UI, some kind of artificial intelligence. We're building for that day. If you haven't started looking at this, we'd recommend that you look at it now, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>